Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for attending uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, of course, uh, had it been a few days ago, uh, you will be trudging through the snow. Um, I recall this little gentleman uh, got a little bit irate when he, he heard on the forecast uh, partly cloudy. And he came in and took his hat off and he tossed in the cloud. He said, so much for the forecast, partly cloudy. I just shoveled six inch of it off my driveway. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the topic generally is about global warming and how it impacts uh, uh, the wine industry, strictly, uh, strictly speaking, the viticulture aspect of the industry. Uh, so it behooves me, first of all, to put this uh, talk in some broader context of global warming rather than just uh, focus on what's happening uh, uh, to the industry um, in the first instance. First of all, we've heard a, a great deal about global warming. Um, controversy still surrounds uh, um, this particular uh, topic. Uh, there are still a number of skeptics who believe strongly uh, that the kinds of changes we see in the weather and climate uh, are actually a product of natural conditions, natural factors, and that uh, humans have very little to do with, with this. And so I want to, first of all, operate, start off on the assumption that I am a firm believer uh, of the global warming situation, and I am a firm believer uh, of the fact that this is human induced, that it has to do uh, with human activity. Um, so that's my assumption. Secondly, I'd like to first of all say that it is pretty conclusive. Uh, when we look around today uh, at the records, the instrument record in terms of temperature going back several hundred years, some of which, of course, is reconstructed data, that is data based on ice core and, and pollen and uh, dendrochronology, tree ring analysis. Um, and some, of course, uh, is instrument based. And, uh, and we've had some controversy, of course, uh, with respect to the instruments, uh, the location of those instruments and so on and so forth, and uh, the conversion from one unit to the next and so on and so forth. Putting all of that aside, however, the instrument records show very close, very clearly uh, that, that we are in a global warming situation. The changes in our area probably are not as dramatic as they are in the Arctic and Antarctic areas. Uh, these, air, these are the most ecologically sensitive areas. Uh, we're seeing significant uh, reduction in ice cover. Uh, in the Arctic area. We're seeing significant uh, melting in the, of the Greenland ice sheet. We're seeing also major changes elsewhere in the ecosystem. What you have here is the average uh, global mean temperature. And uh, what you see is a departure from the 1961-1990 normal. For the purpose of comparison, when we try to compare climate change with, uh, between different regions of the world, we have to agree on certain parameters and we have to agree on a certain period. And so the reference period used by the WM or the World Meteorological Organization is a reference period that we are using here. And so uh, we measure the departure from that at mean temperature. And as you can see from uh, this diagram here, that we are certainly are in a global warming situation. Uh, the changes are not dramatic. Uh, temperature changes are not dramatic. They are fairly imperceptible. Uh, what, what, you, what are dramatic, of course, are significant reduction in ice cover. Uh, major changes, of course, to weather patterns. We are beginning to see more extremes in weather events. Now, I don't think uh, the heavy snowfall that we had the other day is necessarily attributed to global warming. Uh, it's part of the synoptic conditions that we find with respect to North American weather. We're living in the middle latitude region, an area where no two days are the same. The weather is highly variable uh, from one day to the next, from one week to the next, and from one year to the next. 
And as you know, uh, as viticulturists, as uh, winemakers, uh, it is a challenge in this kind of climate. Uh, you never see the same summer uh, each year, unless you're living in the tropics. And that is a major challenge for viticulture, is the high degree of variability, both on a daily basis and on a seasonal and on a yearly basis. So first of all, on a global scale, we are seeing uh, major changes, major shifts uh, in weather systems to some extent, and certainly those show up in the temperature, uh, in the temperature record. Now, people can relate uh, to what's happening in their own personal life and also can relate uh, more directly uh, to the weather systems that impact them directly. And so this is where the local weather, the regional weather, uh, we tend to pay more attention to that. And so what I try to do, first of all, is to look at the data uh, for a number of climatic stations in Ontario, uh, chosen from the main uh, wine regions, namely Lake Erie, North Shore, and of course the Niagara region. Uh, these are the two principal areas, and of course we have Pelee Island, and just recently created, of course, is Prince Edward County. But these are two stations, the Harrow Station and the Vineland Station, both, of course, were stations established a long time ago, going back to the 1890s, uh, with very, very good record uh, and the station, the location of these stations is very, very critical. The Harrow Station uh, is located still in a relatively rural environment. Things have not changed dramatically around Harrow. Harrow is still a relatively small community of about 3,000 people. Uh, and the Vineland Station also, even though Vineland has grown dramatically, the location of Vineland Station uh, is actually a very good one from the standpoint of the study of climate change. Namely, we are saying that these stations give us a pretty good representation of the larger region, namely the Niagara region. Bearing in mind, of course, that there are significant differences in the, uh, in the micro and mesoclimate. But in analyzing climate, uh, trends in climate change, you don't necessarily have to use a slew of stations uh, because we're trying to represent the region and one climatic station can uh, do that quite adequately. That's the same notion used in weather forecasting. There's only one station used in the Niagara region for weather forecasting, namely the Niagara District Airport Station, because weather systems are fairly big, they're fairly pervasive. So what we have here then is a trend analysis of the maximum temperature going back to the 1930s. And you might have read in the Global Mail just recently, yesterday's edition of the Global Mail, uh, where they've looked at uh, the, all the stations uh, for Canada and they've done a regional analysis in Ontario over the last, uh, uh, over the last I guess, 70 years, uh, temperatures have increased. Mean annual temperatures have increased in the order of 1.4 degrees centigrade. Now, perhaps you may think that is not significant. When the annual mean temperature of the Niagara region is about 10 degrees centigrade, and you have an annual increase in the order of one point something degrees, you're looking at over a 10% increase in a relatively short period of time. One of the concerns with climate change is not so much the fact that the climate is changing, that is a well-established fact that when you look at the long-term history of the Earth, you'll see that there have been shifts uh, in climate from one century to the next, and certainly on a, on a much longer time scale in the order of hundreds of thousands of years, and so on and so forth. What concerns us mostly uh, with respect to global warming is the rate at which the changes are taking place. Not so much the fact that the climate is changing, uh, but the rate at which we are seeing these changes. Now, climate change, uh, if taken uh, seriously, uh, and it has to be taken seriously by our policymakers, by our governments, because they set the policies and programs uh, in order for us to be compelled to act in a certain responsible manner. Uh, leaving us the individual, I don't think much could be done. But, but also on a much larger uh, level, we need a concerted effort by government so the entire society moves in the same direction. And so this information is extremely critical in terms of what kind of strategies we adopt. Now, my talk is not really about what we'll do about global warming and how it affects agriculture, and in, fact, in particular viticulture, what are the solutions are. I don't have any solution at this point in time. 
what I just want to show you is what's actually happened uh, to the climate of these areas and leave it up to uh, the experienced viticulturist in terms of what should be done. I may propose a few solutions, but uh, that's not intention at this point. I'm just dealing with problems. So what we have here then is the long-term record. And as you can see then, beginning in the, uh, from the 1930s, uh, we have seen a warming trend in the 1930s and going uh, through World War II. And then a dramatic uh, change, drop in temperature in the 1960s. And in fact, uh, uh, it was a common belief back then that we probably are entering uh, an ice age. Uh, temperatures globally, and I, I might add, this not only reflects the situation in Canada, the decrease in temperature uh, during the 19, late 50s and 60s, in fact, is a global reduction in temperature for no major reason. It could very well be due to uh, uh, sunspot activities, reduction in sunspot activities. And then, of course, into the 70s, we have temperatures begin to increase. Now, the 70s, of course, was a period of extreme dry conditions, and agriculture was in a very tough shape uh, back then. Uh, you may recall uh, the problems with drought and desertification in Africa and the major starvation that was taking place in many of the Asian countries. And of course, at the same time, the so-called Green Revolution attempt made uh, to grow more food to uh, feed a burgeoning population, global population. Fortunately, we've, we've uh, overcome some of that. Uh, and then we get into the 80s. And in the 80s, uh, we begin to see a steady increase in temperature. Uh, and that, of course, followed in the 90s with a warmer uh, period uh, in recorded history. Uh, this, of course, is what is concerns us. And since then, of course, we've seen uh, changes in temperature, steady increase in temperature as reflected here in the Niagara region. Now, the same information, of course, the same kinds of trends you'll see for Harrow, the same, for, or for that matter, for much of southern Ontario. This is the trend reflected in the instrument record. So, are we, in a, are we warming up? Yes, we are warming up. Um, but more importantly, as we'll see, uh, what has actually happened, and that's just a smooth uh, uh, five-year running mean of the temperature going back. And as you can see then, uh, from this period on, uh, both in terms of the minimum temperature, uh, the minimum temperature, in fact, is the one you'll see is seeing more significant increase. In other words, the nighttime temperature is getting warmer. It's getting warmer at night. The maximum temperature, in fact, is not increasing at the same rate as the minimum temperature. The minimum temperature is one that's been shown to increase uh, globally. Uh, so uh, that, is a, that is, of course, might be good for viticulture. In some cases, might not be. Uh, we'll, we can talk about that later. I want to also, before I focus on the Niagara region, to bring some perspective on what's happening elsewhere. This is a study done by Greg Jones, a fellow climatologist. Uh, he was here last year, I think, to give a talk. And uh, this is, uh, these are some of the trends in the growing, mean growing season temperature. And as I said, this is a departure from the 1961-1990. Uh, that's the reference period. So as you can see then, in the Burgundy Beaujolais region, there's been a steady increase in temperature. What you find also is not only an increase, but what is of concern is a high degree of variability. Okay, so while the temperature has been increasing quite steadily, uh, no two summer seasons are the same, no two years are the same. And this is one of the challenges we face, especially, these are all mid-latitude, uh, with the exception of Barolo, which is a Mediterranean-type climate. But a Mediterranean-type climate also has a high degree of variability. Now, this is a concern uh, for uh, the person growing grapes, because as you know, no two year is the same. Uh, you have a, a one winter is very cold, another winter warm. Uh, excessively uh, hot summer and another cool summer. But overall, the trends are an increase in trend. So variability is one of the characteristics of the climate, but also what we're seeing here is an increase in trend. And similarly for this, this is a, a prediction of what could happen given the situation if, if present conditions uh, were to persist in the future, uh, you could then see a greater increase in temperature. Now, that might be a good scenario. In some cases, it might not be, it might not be a good one uh, uh, in other situations. But let me say, in weather forecasting, there's something called a persistent forecast. 
and a climatological forecast. The persistent forecast is that if conditions are what they are now, uh, six, 12 hours from now, those conditions will persist downwind. And so whatever Ohio Valley gets, right, eventually the same conditions we will receive. So this is, the, this is the analogy used here in terms of what is likely to happen, uh, for example, in 50 years from now. If present conditions were to continue, if we still continue to quarrel about strategies to reduce uh, emissions, and we continue to uh, emit at fairly high levels, and that is not about to change, uh, even though in Canada we're still discussing things in Canada, uh, still a lot of controversy. This is one of the uh, unfortunate things of, about what strategies we should, should adopt and how we should adopt those strategies. But these are some of the things I just wanted to show you that uh, this, is not, uh, this is happening elsewhere, especially within the middle latitude regions. And also some areas where we'll see some significant changes in terms of this is for the, the west coast, the, along Oregon and northern California. Uh, you're seeing major changes uh, in spring frost, uh, increase in growing season. The California doesn't need an increase in growing season. They have more than uh, that is necessary. But uh, one of the concerns uh, with, with, with uh, certainly uh, California uh, is that it's already a relatively warm uh, area and uh, it's likely to get even warmer. Uh, and so some of the cool climate varieties such as Spinor and Chardon that are grown, uh, I'm not certain how those varieties will thrive if conditions continue to persist in the future. And similarly for the Willamette Valley area, this is data presented, as I said, by uh, Washington, Oregon, all increasing trends. And as I said, you're using the departure from the 1960, uh, 61, 1990 uh, normal period. Okay. What I want to do then for the Niagara region, one of our biggest problems, our biggest nemesis, and Dr. Boss can attest to that, we've all been fighting winter, right? Our biggest nemesis, of course, is winter. Is the winter getting milder? Uh, is it getting colder? Or are we seeing variability? And so I want to see what's happening to winter temperatures. Um, and so I did an analysis of of the so-called extreme minimum temperatures. Now, we know for uh, viticulture, uh, minus 20 is often used, but as we know that minus 20, uh, if it occurred in January and February, and no warm period precede those, uh, those temperatures, it's unlikely that you'll have any bud damage. But minus 20, if it occur in the latter part of March or middle March, preceded by a relatively mild condition, uh, you could see significant bud damage. So, uh, the critical temperatures are critical relative to the phenology of the vine, okay? And so, nonetheless, what I try to do is to see, look at the occurrence of extreme minimum temperatures to see what kind of trend uh, we are experiencing if, in fact, our winters are getting milder or are getting colder or simply uh, varies from one year to the next. And so, here's an example of the occurrence of extreme minimum temperature. I had minus 12. I looked at all the temperatures below minus 12, right up to, for the Niagara region, I think down to minus 26. Minus 26, of course, in the area below the escarpment, but on top of the escarpment, there are temperatures, in some cases, lost minus 28, and believe me, in the Niagara region, we've had temperatures down to minus 32 degrees. Now, not where viticulture is, but in the Lake Erie side, uh, I did a mo some monitoring about six years ago in a vineyard in Dunville. There's an individual put in uh, uh, 13,000 vines, all Cabernet Sauvignon, Cab Franc, and Merlot. And uh, they were planted, and you went there towards the end of September, and everything looked great. Came winter, temperatures plummeted down to minus 30 degrees. Now, Everyone thinks that the Niagara region is the banana belt of, uh, of Ontario. But believe me, uh, Lake Ontario is a saving grace. Uh, Lake Erie has some effect on the temperatures, but certainly not on winter temperatures. So we do experience some very low temperatures in the Niagara region. And this is why our forefathers were smart enough to plant grapes below as close as possible to Lake Ontario. Uh, so we do, we're seeing some fairly low temperatures, but 
Unfortunately, we're not monitoring those temperatures. Most of the sensors set up by Environment Canada are in the preferred uh, areas and not in the areas where we like to, agriculture would like to move at some point. But the point is that there are some low temperatures uh, within the region. So what we have here, this is not a very strong trend at all. Okay, so if you're hoping that the winters are getting milder, the occurrence of extreme temperatures are getting fewer and fewer, that's not the case. There is a slight decreasing trend. Uh, this is the average number of uh, events where the temperature drops to below minus 20 and lower. Uh, an average, of course, is really not a very good statistic to use because nothing happens. The average never occurs in any one day. Uh, climatic, uh, when we talk of the normal temperature, you never get the normal. Things are always above and below that. So, but nonetheless, as a reference point, uh, we use the normal. What we really interested in are the variability, and that's what our region is. And this is very much characteristic of much of the climate of southern Ontario, subjected to high degree of variability. So you can appreciate then why viticulture is so risky in this area. It's not a predictable climate, such as a Mediterranean climate. Uh, Mediterranean climates have some degree of predictability, especially during the growing season, but their precipitation which is the important constraint on viticulture in, in the Mediterranean climate, is also very, very unreliable and highly variable. So as far as extreme minimum temperatures are concerned, I really don't see any major trend there. It looks like a, a decreasing trend, uh, but really not, not the case. I then also look at the, from the standpoint of the ice wine industry, because as you know, uh, picking wine grape in March is just a waste of time because there's not much left there. If you're leaving grapes for ice wine by March, the birds have had it or they pretty much have rotted. And so what I've decided to do is to look at the temperatures for the month of January, February, and of course December, January, and February. And look at the occurrence of temperatures below minus eight. Uh, because that's a critical temperature. But minus eight by itself is not uh, in itself adequate for ice wine. You need to have a cooler uh, temperatures below at least minus six, minus seven, building up to minus eight. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So occurrence of minus eight doesn't necessarily uh, suggest that, well, we can go out there and pick ice wine because the grapes may not be completely frozen. So I try to look for a cluster of periods where you have temperatures dropping to minus eight and below because I think that uh, from the VQA standpoint, probably is the thing to do. Uh, so as you can see then, uh, the January is the coldest month uh, by far and fairly consistent. Uh, this is the average number of days uh, in January and the temperature drops to minus eight and below. So roughly about uh, 12, 13 days. Uh, this is showing some uh, decreasing trend for the most part. Uh, not a very, very strong trend. This is the data going back from 1977 to present day to 2007. So there is, a, there is some uh, decline in the number of days uh, in January. And similarly, February is certainly more pronounced, where the, the number of days uh, over the course uh, of this period here, where the temperature is de declining. Uh, December, we know December for the most part doesn't have an, a lot of days where the temperature dropped to minus eight. But nonetheless, our month, December, uh, the variability is not that great, but it shows a slightly decreasing trend. So overall, it appears that we're having fewer days uh, with temperatures below uh, minus 8 degrees um, for the purpose of ice wine. But as I said also, uh, counting minus 8 uh, and is not necessarily the right thing to do. You need to have a cluster of these where the temperatures drop uh, certainly from minus six and moving on to minus eight and below. And so I think that probably is a better indication because as you know, we've had a lot of snow out there, but really the weather was not very cold. Uh, much of the precipitation that we get here, the mixed back precipitation comes from the warm front. The temperatures never really plummeted to any sub-zero level. And so even though it may look anyone coming from uh, from uh, the Bahamas at this time of the year and land in Canada, so wow, this ram I didn't think the Arctic was so close. Uh, we'll find that it's really not that cold, right? Uh, so I think as far as the winter temperatures are concerned, 
I'm beginning to see that there is a trend, that there is a moderating trend uh, in winter temperatures. Uh, our winters are not getting uh, colder. Uh, we're not seeing uh, the extremes in temperature, and this is a situation for southern Ontario. I'm not just saying this for the Niagara region. This is a situation because I've looked at the record for uh, Harrow, and there is interest also in growing grapes in Norfolk County and Huron County, so I've looked at the data for these stations. And I would say Huron County, which is devoid of any major uh, built uh, human inference, uh, which gives you a very good uh, indication of the background uh, climate, that area is showing trends similar to that of the Niagara regions. In fact, much of southern Ontario. And frost-free days. Well, one of our thing, one of our limitations, as you know, uh, is when we tried to assess the growing season condition of an area, we looked at the number of frost-free days. Now, the threshold used here for viticulture is minus two degrees. So the occurrence of minus, the last occurrence of minus two, whether it be in late April or early May, and the first occurrence of minus two, whether it be in September, October, or November. So minus two is the threshold used uh, for delimiting the length of the frost-free period. And as we can see here then, that there is an increasing trend in the number of frost-free days. Uh, variability, certainly in this area here, but from the 1990s, uh, you're seeing an increase uh, in the number of frost-free days, uh, with, ex with the exception of these two years. And this is reflective or indicative of the worldwide trend, okay? Believe me, uh, the 1990s, beginning of the 1980s and 1990s, uh, these trends are not just within the Niagara region. Um, much of the work done in climate change and, uh, and, and trying to ascertain the degree of change and where these changes are cha taking place and the actual rate of change uh, shows very, very clearly that the 1980s onward that we're seeing a significant steady increase in temperature. The question is, will, will, those, will that trend persist? We don't know, okay? I wish, to t I wish I could tell you that that trend will persist, but we can only go on basis, we try to forecast the future by looking at what occurred in the past. Okay, because the past has a lot of influence in the future. This is a so-called uh, climatological forecast. So if the trends are present now, they will continue in the future unless something else happens. Okay, in looking at the, the wine industry, I'd like to look at the beginning of spring because we want to think that uh, in looking at uh, climate change the, and within the middle latitude region, uh, probably the most sensitive area uh, we are likely to see uh, significant changes would be in the beginning of spring. And similarly, we'll talk about fall. So I wanted to find out whether our April is getting warmer, uh, whether our growing season starts earlier. And as you can see, this is the month of April, and uh, this is the number of heat units accumulated in the month of April. April, for the most part, very little. And this is a trend uh, for much of the of Ontario wine region. Uh, we define the growing season as beginning in April, but really uh, no significant accumulation uh, of heat units uh, in April. Uh, we can see in the case of May, again, throughout, with the exception of one thing about April is that uh, the number of heat units from one year to the next doesn't vary significantly. This is one good thing about April. April remains a relatively cool month uh, and doesn't show much variability, but May is the one that shows a lot of variability, a fairly weak increase in trend, but very, very variable. In other words, then, May is, uh, can be cool, it can be warm, it can be moderately cool, it could be moderately warm. Uh, so there's no real major trend in May. Uh, unlike some areas, uh, we looked at, uh, for example, in the Burgundy Champagne region, uh, bud bursts came fairly early, heat accumulation in those areas fairly early. In Alsace region, some of the studies done uh, show uh, fairly early bud bursts. It doesn't appear to be in our situation. There are some years, but for the most part, the trend is a highly, uh, highly variable trend, fairly erratic. I also looked at the growing season uh, heat units for the entire period because uh, you want to see whether we can grow Syrah in this area here or not. I know it's been maybe bring on the global warming if you want to do that, but 
interesting thing about the heat units here, and everyone knows that this is the threshold is 10 degree base, uh, uh, and there is uh, a cutoff point. What we're finding here, and this is very interesting, is that uh, in this period here, a uh, great deal of variability, but for the most part, uh, when we get into the 1990s uh, and later on, a uh, fairly significant increase. Now, I'm not certain whether to say that this is a, an increase in trend or not, because it really uh, doesn't show uh, any... There is a trend of some sort, but it's not a very strong trend. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, this, again, unlike, uh, much like the other data, uh, shows a high degree of variability. In other words, uh, the heat units in any one year, uh, we know this is the average for the Niagara region. Uh, when we talk about our, uh, the average number of heat units, 1,400 is, is the average. Um, Harrow area, Lake Erie North Shore, has roughly about 1,500, slightly higher than, than the Niagara region. Their, their growing season, of course, also starts about a week or two earlier. And Lake Erie has a much milder influence, especially on the fall climate, because Lake Erie is much warmer. And so vineyards located close to Lake Erie benefit from an early warm-up, because the southwestern part of Lake Erie is the shallowest. It first to thaw out and, and warm up. And so that area actually does benefit. Pelee Island has the highest number of heat units of, of any of area in Canada. Um, so we're seeing some increasing trend, but again, as I said, uh, the, the degree of variability is very, very high. And this is one of the things about climate change, is that even though we may see some persistence in a particular trend, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean things are going straight up like that. It's subjected to a lot of variability, variable but increasing. That's, that's the point I want to say. It's variable, but it's increasing. And this is just, I wanted to uh, I put this here because I just want to focus on the Niagara, but I, sh I put Lake Erie North Shore here in the Niagara region, and I wanted to tell you, as I said at the very beginning, that the, the change in climate for southern Ontario is very much a change as reflected in the climatic record for any one station. Uh, these are changes, as you can see, very much the same, very much in synchrony, uh, not, nothing out of, uh, synchrony, uh, out of order here. So both are increasing, showing increase, and of course, as I said early on, uh, this area here, if you're going to grow any grapes that would, uh, some of the, the powerful reds, I think, and not to uh, belittle the Niagara region in any way, uh, that Lake Erie Nurture has the potential uh, to grow some of the, 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 some of the, the, the reds that we want to grow, some of the, the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Syrah, because the heat units in that area, for the most part, number over 500 growing degree days. Um, and the growing season, much, much longer. Uh, the, the fall does not drop off as dramatically uh, as it does in the Niagara region, especially for vineyards away from the lake. Uh, vineyards away from the lake, you see a significant drop uh, uh, in the temperatures, especially after September. And the, the, this is the Hugon Index, and uh, the Hugon Index is also another index uh, used uh, um, for assessing the growing season potential of an area, and it shows the same kind of pattern as the Hitchin, is the so-called Winkler Index, uh, very much the same. Uh, so this is a point that I wish to make. This, this is a situation we are in this area, uh, more variability. I know Andy is doing quite a bit of work with uh, irrigation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the scenarios for global warming is uh, even though we may see warmer temperatures, we'll see significant drop in lake levels, and that's occurring even as I speak, uh, as evidenced by more open waters. Uh, lake Erie uh, has a significant area of open water, and Lake Erie is probably the most sensitive of the lakes because it's relatively shallow, shallow. so it's the one that's, that's the one lake that's more thermally reactive. Lake Ontario is like me. It doesn't cool down, it doesn't warm up, right? Um, and for the most part, remains relatively ice-free. Um, but one of the concerns with an increase in temperature is the occurrence of extreme uh, maximum temperature over, over 30 degrees. And for vines, that could translate to some moisture stress, especially if you're growing them on shallow soils. And I think this is a concern here because we're seeing, especially in this period onwards, uh, more 
we, we don't have to see uh, this occurring on a day-to-day, -day, on a year-to-year -year basis. I think three years in a row, if you have three years in a row where you have excessively high temperatures during the growing season, it's enough to stress the vines and the need, therefore, for artificial irrigation. So I can see this coming into the Niagara region at some point. Uh, at a drip irrigation, which I think is probably the desirable one as, as opposed to overhead, I could see this coming at some point uh, because uh, the occurrence of extreme minimum temperature is something that is not occurring not only in the viticulture area, but this is something that is of concern uh, to all of uh, Canada, especially in the urban areas where it does affect air quality. Much of the ozone that we get is attributed to temperatures above 25 degrees. So, getting then into the fall, so the other uh, area, the transitional periods, uh, April, May, and then we get into the September, October transitional period. Because in our region here, we really, if we can get our growing season earlier, and, and also, of course uh, delay it uh, also in the fall, that would be the ideal situation. And so I think this is very clear. This is a situation for, um, this is the uh, heat units for the month of uh, um, October, this is the October one, and this is the uh, September. And we are seeing, certainly from, as you can see, just, just before we move on to, uh, to September, October also, we don't get a lot of heat units. The average number of heat units in October is just barely 50. So our growing season from middle October onwards, actually, um, the vines, the grapes are just sitting on the vine there, but in the exceptional years, you may have some warmer temperatures. Um, but really, uh, our growing season uh, ends by, by the end of September, first two weeks of October. Um, as we see, and this is a trend throughout. Uh, this is a data going back for at least 38 years. So we don't have a significant amount of heat accumulation uh, in, in September, uh, sorry, October. But September shows a fairly strong trend. And so uh, both areas, we can see that there is an increase in trend. That's the point I want to make here. That uh, that our fall seemed to be getting slightly warmer, and that might be a good thing. And this is the same thing with the heliothermal, the Hugelin Inglis. This is, thus, as I said, another measure of uh, heat accumulation. Uh, uh, October, uh, relatively flat, but certainly September uh, is getting warmer. Temperatures during the ripening period, so I also looked at the uh, temperature for uh, the month of September and October, and again, uh, and August, September, October, this is August, September, and October. August, again, seemed to be getting warmer. September, we said also warmer, and a slight increasing uh, trend also uh, for October. So I think in all, uh, I think this uh, area, the, the fall, appears to be the one area that is seeing some warming trend. Now, it goes to show to some extent uh, that it could be a warming that is a result of the fact that the lake, Lake Ontario in particular, uh, in a warm summer, it picks up a lot, takes up a lot of energy, and of course, uh, it delays, of course, the onset of any major, uh, major cooling. So uh, Lake Ontario would more than likely have a beneficial effect on on the fall temperatures by delaying the cooling period. In the spring, obviously, Lake Ontario does have a, a, a cooling uh, influence and tends to hold back the season somewhat. And so one of the things that uh, I find about this particular area is that Lake Ontario in particular is the major influence in terms of slowing down the rate of warming or cooling within the region. Okay. Uh, Lake Erie doesn't do it to the same extent, uh, but Lake Ontario, if we were to look at the data uh, for, for example, the, uh, the, the Okanagan region, um, where you do have lakes, but lakes don't have such a big influence on the, on the, only on the microclimate, not so much in the large scale climate, you'll find that uh, the influence there, you'll find dramatic changes in temperature, a fairly high rate of temperature increase, for this, especially the southern Okanagan area. So Lake Ontario, the Great Lakes in general, I think, are, are really uh, slowing down the rate of warming uh, 
And that, I think, is certainly a good thing. Gives us enough time to make the necessary adjustments. One of the concerns, of course, with uh, global warming is that a lot of the models predict an increase in temperature. Uh, sorry, an increase in precipitation. But the precipitation, of course, would be offset by high temperatures, high evaporation, high evapotranspiration rates. And the thing about total precipitation uh, from the standpoint of viticulture, total precipitation during the growing season is really not a very meaningful statistic to use because it belies what actually happens during the growing season. What you really want is, uh, is analysis of the distribution of the precipitation during the growing season. So I stayed away from that, but I know that very important for wine quality is precipitation during the ripening period in the month of September and October. And I want to see how that, in fact, uh, what kind of trends we're seeing in precipitation. As you know, in this area here, what could be a great vintage year can easily be dashed by very heavy rains, especially in September. September is a month with lots of rain, and then, of course, there's a slight reduction in rain in October, and then it goes back up again in, in November, December. Uh, we're not seeing any, uh, any major trend as far as precipitation during the growing season. Uh, a slight incre uh, increase in trend, but for the most part, uh, not as variable, mind you. In other words, the variability is not that great, except for, again, in this period here. But for the most part, the total precipitation during the growing season, this is the month of September and October together, uh, for the most part, hasn't changed dramatically. But we are seeing some variability here. Okay. Um, and I did it for the individual months. Uh, again, the trend is the same uh, for September, no major trend, uh, and certainly in October as well. Um, we expect some degree of variability, um, which is natural for precipitation because uh, our weather systems, much of the weather systems that affect us here in, in the September and October are all frontal system and low, uh, and low pressure system. We don't we really get any convective shower in, in, in September and October. So much of the precipitation you get is fairly pervasive due to cold fronts and warm fronts and low pressure. The summer months, precipitation tend to be more scattered because uh, of uh, occurrence of differential heating across the peninsula. So we can expect this for much of the Niagara region. In fact, much of the, the precipitation we get here uh, in the fall um, is due to the movement of the low pressure system. So no, not much variation during this period here. So I, what are my conclusions? Well, I think we are seeing some trends in, in first of all, in the frost-free period. There's no question about that. And I think the frost-free period, uh, any extension to the frost-free period is not occurring in the, uh, in the spring, but in the fall. So we're getting a warmer fall, it appears. Um, the unfortunate thing about our fall, and this is uh, the problem with most mid-latitude climate, is that you get fairly dry conditions, and then you have a resumption of, uh, of all of the jet stream begin to move down south, and you have a frequent low-pressure system. So what could be a great, uh, great uh, vintage year, um, we can have problems with September, and especially for the early season varieties such as Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and for that matter, for all varieties if the rains are excessive. So for us in the Niagara region for, or within southern Ontario, um, I think the changes are there. Okay, And thank God they're not dramatic. Uh, the changes are there. They're imperceptible. They're slow. Uh, they creep up. Okay, and in the course of time, because this industry is not established just for the benefit of us living, I presume that this industry will be here and it will flourish for generations. And so I think uh, it is incumbent uh, on us uh, to take the necessary steps to look to the direction which the climate is going and to make and to think and to do, act constructively in terms of what strategies we will adopt. Uh, we can't rush out there and start growing uh, uh, the uh, California variety or Bordeaux varieties everywhere. But I think we need to pay attention to what, what is happening to the environment and how we can best adjust to those. And that, of course, is where the controversy lies in terms of uh, climate change and, 
and the so-called adjustments. What strategies should we adopt? Because every strategy has some social, economic, or political uh, implication. And so, as a society, I think it's, uh, it's important for us uh, to act together. Uh, the research, I think, is extremely important. Uh, providing good climatic data, I think, is very, very important. It's unfortunate that we have a large number of monitoring sites within the Niagara region, but with the exception of the 12 or 13 sites where you have some coordination of activity, everyone is climbing the proverbial mountain only to find out that someone else is there. In other words, we're doing different things, but we need to have, uh, we need to, to have a concerted effort uh, to make certain that we share that climatic data. Environment Canada used to do that. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, much of the services provided by Environment Canada have been privatized. Uh, but we need, we need to have a common body uh, uh, to provide this kind of information, not climatic data only, but also the phenological data and so on and so forth. I'm just a lonely climatologist doing my little stuff here. But that's my view, my take on, on the situation. Thank you. I, I think if we have, um, yes, if the winters, if the summers are getting warmer and we have the heat units, then the only thing that we need to address is how to protect the vines uh, from winter damage. Uh, we could see probably a shift uh, to some varieties that are not as, uh, as hardy but would require a higher number of heat units. My biggest concern is that um, we don't have a consistency in our climate. Uh, so Carbonius sauvignon, for example, is not a variety that does well each year. Some years it does well, some years it doesn't. So to make a long story short, uh, it is difficult to say uh, because we're, we have a, a battle on, on a number of fronts. Uh, on one hand, uh, we have extremes in terms of very cold winters. We can have dramatic drop in temperatures in the fall. Uh, and we can have also significant reduction in precipitation or excessively high precipitation. So it's, it's very difficult to say whether we can switch to other varieties on the basis of uh, milder climate. Because it's not just, uh, the issue is not just winter. Uh, the issues also has to do with, uh, uh, but also with precipitation. Kevin. Yeah. I think this is one of the concerns with uh, some of the varieties. Some of the varieties that we have um, have a relatively high chilling requirement. And so those varieties are able to, um, to remain dormant well into February. If we go to our varieties that have a lower chilling requirement, the chances are uh, once those chilling requirements are met, more than likely you could see significant problems in January. So I think the children requirements is a big factor. Um, and uh, that could be a problem 
for choosing varieties uh, that have very low children requirements. Uh, ones with the longer children requirements that we have, I think will do well because they continue to remain dormant. And uh, even though you may have a milder spring, the chances are they may escape the frost. One of the concerns I find with, this, uh, with the climate, especially in the winter months, milder winters doesn't necessarily mean you'll not have uh, winter injury. Milder winters actually could predispose the vine to a higher degree of risk, mainly because the warmer temperatures allow these buds. I think for most of the vinifera vines, I think a, a chilling requirement of 1,000 degrees is what is required based on five degrees accumulation. And once these vines have achieved that uh, 1,000 uh, chilling hours, they're ready to go. And so milder temperatures could mean that early bud break and therefore cold snaps. Because as we, we find, we are in a middle latitude region. We're not in a Mediterranean, southern Mediterranean areas. We're not growing grapes in southern California or southern parts of Italy or France or, or, or for that matter, uh, uh, in uh, Portugal or wherever you. Uh, we're growing grapes in the middle latitude. So on a day that might look very, very nice and calm in the spring, you could see a major, uh, uh, the cold, a cold front snap moves through, or you have the jet stream that moves south of the Great Lake, pulling down cold temperatures. This is a concern uh, with the climate, and this is not just the Niagara region. This is a problem, for example, that Burgundy faces, uh, the Champagne region. Um, we think that they have a great climate, but in fact, the, the Champagne climate is fairly marginal. It will benefit from a, high, a longer growing season, more heat in it. But the problem, the intractable problem of the seesaw and weather still remains, and that's one of the concerns. Well, I've never heard of hurricane, uh, sorry, tornadoes in January. We've had tornadoes in southern Ontario in January. That's, that's a very, very rare phenomenon. We've had some very destructive tornadoes in January and February in the southern parts of the United States. Why? Because the jet stream dipped way, way down south, right? And the snow that we've had over the past weekend had to do with the jet stream moving back north and but staying on the east coast for the most part. Uh, pumping warm moist here off the Gulf of Mexico. Those situations are very difficult to predict. The forecasters, uh, believe me, weather prediction in some cases like shooting fish in a tank, right? You take an aim, right? Um, it's, it's not a precise. Uh, we're dealing with so many different variables. Uh, forecasting uh, climate change is not a precise science. And I mean, this is not a, a, a something that uh, I'm the first one to say. Uh, they they're always talk about probabilities. There's a chance of this, there's a chance of that. And so there are always different kind of scenarios that are described. These scenarios are never perfect because, as we know, uh, the climate system is a very, very complex system. It's not just the atmosphere. It's affected by oceans, it's affected by, by land surfaces. So uh, forecasters, what they do is they look at... Uh, 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 an area, a period where events are dissimilar, are similar, and then they try to look for those events in the future and they tell you, okay, based on that particular scenario, this is what you can expect in the future. The same thing for uh, impact on agriculture. We looked at scenarios, we looked at areas in the United States where the climate is what we forecast in a global warming situation. And then we say, okay, what happens, for example, in North Virginia or South Virginia, North Carolina? That's the situation that could likely happen, for example, in Niagara region, because those conditions are happening there right now. They have an idea. It's the same thing with uh, forecasting hurricanes. They look at the system on, on the satellite, they look at the cloud cover, the cemetery, and they look at a slew of satellite imageries from the past. They know what that hurricane in the past did. They know the characteristics of the storm. They know the impact and so on and so forth. And they look for those characteristics in the present storm. And so that's one way in which they're able to forecast. It's not an exact science. Um, believe me, if they knew that, they'd never say there's a chance of shower. It'll tell you it'll rain, right? So you, you always say there's a 50% chance. That way you're never right or wrong. I hope I answer your question. <laughs>